Welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast, where each week you get to hear Sean Steele, professional CEO, growth mentor, and advisory board chair, unpack the strategies that successful founders have used to achieve scale in their businesses. Stay tuned as he interviews the entrepreneurs who've made it, learns from industry experts, and follows a group of founders still striving to scale. G'day everyone and welcome to the Scale Ups podcast where we help first time founders learn the secrets of scaling so they can fundamentally fulfill the potential of their businesses, make bigger decisions with greater confidence and maximize the impact and value they can create in the world. I'm your host Sean Steele and I'm joined today by Peter Strakorb, founder and principal of uh, of your only aptly name, your own <laughs> aptly named advisory, Peter. Uh, Twenty right. years in sales and marketing roles, uh, from you know SMEs through to multinationals, uh, before establishing your practice about ten years ago. And you've been, you know, primarily focusing on the sort of mid market companies and and helping them understand how buyers have changed over time and haven't they changed, uh, and how to adapt their approaches using your your proprietary method around uh, the buyer-focused sales funnel. How are you going today, Peter? Very well so far, as uh, as can be expected under Sydney lockdown. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> With uh, Indeed. three teenagers in the house, one wife and one dog. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Actually, I had a virtual dinner with friends last weekend because they've been in lockdown like you for on a good couple of months, and they've got you know a six- and a three-year-old, and they're both trying to work full-time at home, and they, yeah, <laughs> they yeah, are struggling. It, it is it is tough, tough. But, but you know the um the kids would probably say it's it's a, as much a challenge for them to cope with the parents as, as it is for the parents big to time. cope with the kids right yeah big time i reckon you're 100 percent right well you know for the, for the benefit of the audience i read your first book about seven or eight years ago um uh, which was the one team method and it uh when this was when i was running some uh, large sales and marketing functions so we probably had a you know 100 130, 150 people just in sales and marketing. And uh, I was really looking at how to get the best out of, um, how to get the best out of the alignment between those two. Cause I always found this culture of uh, that sort of emerged as we acquired more businesses. Each business had this culture of, you know, sales lobbing the, you know, sales telling marketing people they weren't getting enough, you know, right quality leads and marketing people telling the sales people they couldn't convert them and so on and so on. And I was trying to figure out how to get alignment out of these functions. Your, and your book really changed how I thought about that permanently. And, and I know that you work with lots of different size businesses, but also many of them, you know, sort of uh, medium to large size. But I know that a lot of the principles that you teach are just as relevant to a first time founder who's trying to figure out how to optimize their sales opportunity. So I really hope that today you and I get an opportunity to dig into how the buyer behavior has changed and what, what you, from your perspective, the things that you think founders um, that are still trying to scale up should be focusing on and how they should be thinking about building out their sales functions and so on. So, um, can we maybe start with you? Let's start with you. How did you end up in sales in the first place? Oh, okay. So there, there is an interesting um, sideline to this because um, I met I met a guy in Sydney who runs a business that helps um, people to identify the right salespeople for them from a personality and and uh, um, skills and aptitude perspective. And and he said something that's always stuck in my mind that namely that if if you if anybody has had a lemonade stand or a paper run or, or something where they where they sell by the age of 12, they're innately um, pre-qualified to end up in sales later <laughs> in life. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. He, he, he also said you can acquire sales skills later. So it's not that you, you have to be mm. born with it. But it, but it helps if you have the um, the mental attitude and, and the, the tendency to, to do that. And I, I actually had um, my very first business at a very young age, and, and so I must have been predestined to to do it. Um, the the other thing is that I, I I've never been fascinated with selling per se. Mm -hmm. I've I've never been fascinated with closing a deal or or, or you know. Uh, any of those sort of usual met metrics that we apply to it, but but I've always been um, very keen on helping people, and and actually my my whole um, philosophy in, in terms of the the one team method or or, or now the, the latest book, um, marketing sell smarter not harder. I'm just just holding it up here for those on on the, on mm -hmm. on the those audio. On YouTube, you get um, to see that video. The then. um the um. The, the principle has always been that if we switch our focus from how we want to sell and what we want to sell to 
helping people to buy from us, the whole dynamic changes. You know, the, this, mm-hmm. this whole pressure to succeed goes away, the, this pressure on, on the sales reps that comes down from above, the pressure that they then pass on to the buyers so that they feel pressure to make a, a, a buying decision you know, as quickly as possible and even when they, then whether they're ready or not. <laughs> all, all that really goes away. And, 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 and I had a little bit of a, not an epiphany, but, but a, a quite an aha moment when um, I was asked to run a sales training course many years ago for a um, um, structural, no, not structural, for a civil engineering company. And the, the CEO wanted them to stop being, well, in addition to being reactive and responding to tenders, the CEO wanted these um, engineers, basically, to learn how to sell and be proactive about it. So, so here I was in this workshop with this, with this down people. Their spine. <laughs> yeah. and, and so this was a physical event um, before the, uh, the pandemic. And, and we, um, we, were sit- we were in this room together and I was at the whiteboard and I just said, look, if I say sales rep, what, what image does that conjure up in your mind? You know, and, and you can imagine what came back. They, they said lying, cheating, tricky, bastard, used car salesperson, all those sort of cliches. Mm-hmm. And, and they really hated the idea of having to sell. Like it was totally foreign to them. It was, it was um, something that they didn't really want to be associ- associated with at all. In, in fact, they didn't even want to be in the workshop. <laughs> So, mm. so great start, you know, for somebody 100%. <laughs> in my position. Yeah, but but the um, the way that I brought them around was that I said, okay, is it okay to help somebody to make an informed buying decision? And they said, well, selling is bad, but helping is good, basically, right? And and so by by changing their mindset and saying like we're not trying to shove something down somebody's throat. But we're, we're trying to, to help them make an informed buying decision that just changed the whole dynamics for them, you know. And, and it also, mm. as I said, it also changes the dynamics for the buyer because they don't feel pushed and pressured and closed, you know, all the, you know, always be closing <laughs> all those techniques all mm-hmm. the time. And, and it's, it's a much better selling experience and it's a much better buying experience when you mm. adopt the attitude of helping somebody to buy. And, and you mentioned I, the… Yeah. So no, sorry, go, go, yeah. keep going. And and you mentioned the the, the buyer focused sales funnel earlier, right? The methodology. So so uh, let me introduce you to that. What you know the the traditional conventional sales funnel where you say you put leads into the top, then they get um, nurtured, they get passed on from marketing to sales, uh, sales then follows up the leads, and eventually kajing kajing a sale drops out, right? That's mm-hmm. the, the traditional sales funnel. Have a guess. When that was first invented, what year? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, which century? Oh, not not the twentieth century. No, it was eighteen ninety eight when it was invented. Wow! So for one hundred and twenty three years, we've been using a, a, a concept that was invented long before the internet, at a time when sellers had all the information and buyers had none, and. Mm. You know, it was based on, 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 on driving a sale forward by informing the buyer and, and pushing them to make a, a, a selling, a buying decision, right? So I got, I got two problems. That, sorry, just to add to that, those of us who are around before the internet will remember that actually real estate agents and car salespeople had a tremendous amount of knowledge. Like I remember those interactions being exceptionally different because you didn't have, you weren't armed with all the information. You didn't rock up with all the data and say, well, I've looked at everything in the market. Let me tell you what I want. It was entirely the opposite. No, very, very few buyers would actually go out and, and uh, look for information before speaking to a sales rep. In fact, they would, they would proactively ring, you know, two or three or four or five sales reps and say, what have you got? <laughs> right now, nowadays, uh, uh, the 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 saying is that it, uh, about two thirds of the buying decision is already made before buyers contact their first rep because they do their research online. They they narrow down the field. They they choose mm. which two or three they don't select to and the, and who whom they want to talk to. If you're one of the um, if if you're not one of the the two or three that they contact, you wouldn't even know the deal's going. Mm. Yeah, you know, the the deal exists. 
and and then even if they do contact you, you still got to battle it out with two or three others that they've also researched. So so selling hasn't really become easier. It's just the the, the buying has become a bit easier, perhaps. But even even Gartner even disputes that. So, so let's not go down that, that rabbit hole. But but I've got I was going to say I've got two problems with the traditional conventional 1898 sales funnel. And that is, it's completely focused on how we want to sell and how we want to measure the progress, and the and the the buyer doesn't even get a mention. Mm, that's yeah. so true. The, the buyer is kind of a, a bit of an afterthought at the end of a of a sales process, you know, when when the transaction happens, and and that's just well, not actually the just real a number world. in that model. They're just you know they're just a little data point somewhere in this magical funnel. <laughs> no, they just have the dollars. They're a percentage <laughs> that gets left behind somewhere <laughs> if they're but, in the, the, prob- the 90% problem is, that doesn't get through to the bottom. Yeah, the, the problem is that the buyer doesn't even feature in there. Yet in mm. today's market, that's the most important part. Right, so so I'm saying let let's not use a 123 year old model anymore, um, because the other thing that it that it drives us to do is to say ah, it all starts with a lead. And the more leads, the better. And then and since 1898, we've had a bit of development in, in technology, and we have now the the Martech stack and the Cell stack, and technology allows us now to reach out to anybody we like. You know, mm-hmm. the most senior people, we can find them, we can get their email address, we can maybe even get their phone number, we, we, can, we can reach people, right? So the technology allows us to reach people, but just because the technology allows us to do that doesn't mean that's what we should do. Because modern buyers don't want to be spammed with glib email messages that are by the very nature of the beast, one size fits all. Because if you send the same email to 10,000 people or 100,000 people, you've got to sort of make it lowest common denominator so it suits everybody. They don't want to be interrupted, have their day interrupted with unsolicited cold calls. Uh, in, in fact, just this morning, I was speaking to somebody, in, so in, true. to somebody in New York, and I actually asked them, I said, how many sales calls, cold sales um, calls do you get every day? Every day? And he said he gets about between 20 and 25 every day. Wow. Every day. He's a, he's a very senior guy, right? I, I then asked him, how many of those calls does he take? And, and he said, at most, one or two. So, so what's the point of getting very junior people to ring very senior people hoping to get engagement and maybe an appointment with them, you know? And, and, and so we, we were actually, this, this, this person in New York and I, we were actually talking about setting up an SDR f- function for them. Mm-hmm. And can you just explain SDR for those who uh, aren't? Uh, sorry, this is, this, these are cold calling outbound uh, sales reps who, who call what we used to call suspects <laughs> to turn them into prospects, to turn them into customers, um, but to start, start a conversation and, and get them interested in what we're selling. The, the I problem with that is that name, suspects. Yeah, we don't use it anymore. Have you noticed no, how everything's awful. elite now? Yeah. Everything's elite, like a, a, a faceless list of, uh, of contacts is now called a lead list. Mm. They're, they're, at best, they're, pro, they're suspects. They're not even prospects because they're not mm. qualified. Anyway, we'll get off, off, off that soapbox now. <laughs> but, but the... Um, so, so the the point I'm making is that more is not better. More mm-hmm. is just more. Yeah. So, so just because the technology allows us to reach anybody, is is not that's not the end game. the The end game is to engage with the right audience. And I, yeah. and I use the term engage purposely because unless it it leads to a sales conversation or, or even better a business conversation. It, uh, it, it's just uh, bothering people. Well, I think this comes right back to your original point around the psychology of what is selling about because I always used to communicate to my sales teams that selling, um, selling is, if you just replace the word sales with serve, that's the whole point, right? I always ask people to get their detective hat on. So, you know, you, you need to understand actually what are the pieces of information that you need to understand the answer to to know whether actually what you have is a potential solution or is not a potential solution to that. And then, so essentially you're just on a fact finding mission. You, you are, you're in detective curiosity mode. And in the absence of knowing that information, you have nothing to offer. There's nothing to sell. And your job is not to push that or influence it. It's, it's to see if those needs actually match up. If the needs match up, all you're doing is saying, hey, here's something that actually could help you, you know, service those needs. 
are you interested? That's a very light touch, you know, that's a low pressure, that's that's a very logical sort of process for people to go through. And to your point, it takes away all of that sort of mystery. Oh, I need to be an amazing influencer or an incredible, you know, uh, song and dance machine to be able to to convince someone to buy something that they don't need. That's not what it's about at all. So given your given that shift to okay, well, people who actually want to be engaged. And what what's an example now of what would be best practice if you let's say you had a b2b business you identify that your ideal decision maker is a i don't know that you're selling it services maybe your ideal decision maker is a cto how do you and all you have is that lead list to your uh, earlier comment you know you have the person's name maybe have their email address maybe you know where they are on socials you've got a, a linkedin profile maybe you even have a phone number what do, you, what do you do with that what's the current what does the current world look like as to what would be an appropriate way to build some engagement start to build a relationship get into that business conversation yeah so the 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 buyer focused sales phone structuralizes all that so it starts off with saying who are i who are our ideal prospects really where are they? How do we get to them? And very importantly, how do we engage with them? I'll come back to that in a minute. Mm-hmm. How do we fend off our competitors? How do we win the deal? How do we not just win that deal, but also get repeat business from the same customer? And last not least, how do we turn our repeat customers into advocates for our business so that they refer new business to us as well? Mm-hmm. So I want to come back to the engagement part. The, we've established that technology can get us to anybody, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean we, we're engaging. So the, the way to engage is, is to create what I call the, the lean forward moment. And the lean forward moment is a moment when a rep says something to the prospect that intrigues them stops them in their tracks and goes, that's really interesting, Sean. Tell me more about that. Hmm. And literally they lean forward at that time. And and at that moment, they also give you the explicit permission to sell to them mm-hmm. because they're showing interest. And I, I talk about the, the seller having to get permission to sell hmm. and not just jump out of the bushes and ambush the, the unsuspecting prospect with the, with a the sales pitch. It's almost permission. It's not almost permission to sell. It's permission to ask questions, right? It's like, well, you may you may have garnered their interest and gathered your lean forward moment, but that doesn't mean that you still know yet whether actually what you've got is suitable for them. So I always think it's like, okay, they lean forward and you lean back and go, they go, hey, I'm interested. Tell me more. And you go, well, hang on a second. I don't know whether this is right for you. So let me get into detective mode. Give me some permission to ask some questions so I can get curious on you. And if I get to the end of that and I think there's actually something here that's of value to you, I'll explain to you what that is, how it works, how much it costs, all those things. If I don't think it's of value to you, I'm not going to be selling you anything. But you've got to give me some space to be able to get those answers. Um, is that? Do you feel that's how? Is that how things are still playing out? Almost. So so the. The buyers these days expect you to have done the homework and, and, and that um, expect you to have done your homework so that you already know enough about the organization. You don't have to start with you know, 20 questions. Yeah, gotcha. They, they, don't, they don't give you the right to ask 20 questions. Okay. But once, you, once you've said to them, whoa, 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 I'm not here to sell you anything or I'm not sure whether I can sell you anything because I don't know whether there's a good fit for us. The, the, the buyer goes, what? You're not trying to sell me something? Yeah. <laughs> and they, they almost get a bit defensive and say, no, 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 I'm still interested. <laughs> mm. So, so it, it's actually quite a good technique to say, look, let's just establish whether there's a good fit for us or not. Right? It's not a trick because mm. let's just face it, if, if there's not a good match, we're both better off knowing, right? And we're 100%. both better off saving our time. It actually helps both parties. Yeah. And and if there is a fit, then we go, okay, now we, we know there's something there. Let's talk about it some more, right? Yeah. So, so uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, let's just see whether there's a good fit for us first. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then you can't just go, oh, well, we do this and we have that and, and you know, we're so yeah. great, which is something I call we-we syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, but asking 
letting the buyer talk about their their particular situation, their their challenges, their their circumstances, so that you can say, oh yeah, actually that matches with what we're doing, and, and here's why, and how you can get it. Yeah. So so establishing a match really early on. So can you give me points. an example though of something that would get the lean forward moment to happen? Just give me an example of a. Is this a, you know, this might be a LinkedIn message or a, you know, what would be an example and just some actual language that people will go, huh, that's actually pretty, and that get them to lean forward. Excellent. So, so for example, I use my, myself as an example. If, if I, um, I always teach my clients to not talk about ourselves. Like I, I try to avoid we, we uh, syndrome as well. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and the, the trick to not talking about yourself is if you start the sentence off with, my clients tell me that, or what my clients love us because. Right? So, so my, my clients love it that I teach them within six weeks how to sell more faster. And I do that through a program that's delineated in, in time, in scope, and in dollars. Got it. Yeah. So six weeks, fixed price, fixed scope, fixed duration. And, and they go, okay, that's interesting. But mm. it, it, you just leave it hanging there. Yeah, and and wait for them to then ask the next question and, and create that lean forward moment that way. Yeah, got it. Okay. Now, as much as I would love to get you to take me through every single step of a typical sales process, I know how much time we've got available. And so, one of the things I really want to get out of you today is you've seen uh, you've seen sales functions and sales practices from very small companies to very large companies. And so you have, and across many industries in both B2B and B2C environments. And so given the nature of our community, which is typically those first time founders still scaling their organizations, probably still sub, you know, $15 million. Some of them are probably still the lead salesperson. Maybe some of them have a sales team. Maybe some only have a few salespeople. What are the three or four key things that you think a founder really needs to focus on in order to scale their their sales outcome really which is what they're after okay so <clears throat> I've, I've had a bit of experience with startups and and pretty much they all do the same thing that they, they're really focused on the product or the app or the or the, the thing that they're building and sales often becomes a bit of an afterthought Initially, it's all about pitching, not to customers, but pitching to investors. Mm-hmm. And and um, customers sort of become a bit of an afterthought. They go, oh, when, when we release the product, that's, that's when the selling starts. Right? And they are often they often come from a technology background because they're, they're a bit geeky. They've, they've developed the, the, the product or the, or the app um, themselves. And, and are driving it forward. So they're f- totally focused on what they're selling, but not on how they want to sell or how they should sell. Mm-hmm. And, and then two thing, one of two things happen. One, one is that they either the, the founder starts trying to sell themselves, and because they've never sold, it's, that doesn't go well. Or they make a few sales to people in their network just through their relationship and somebody feel sorry for them, buy something, you know, they go, Ooh, but, but that doesn't last forever because they're going to run out of contacts to buy. The, the second mistake they then make is to go and say, Oh, I, I need more sales. So I need to hire a sales rep, a BDM. Mm-hmm. And, and I've had lots of conversations with founders who come to me and say, I want to hire, hire a BDM. Do you know any? And, and I, I always ask them the same thing. I say, do you have a value proposition that's proven? Ah, do you have a sales process that engages with a prospect, draws them into a biz, into a business conversation, and uh, helps them to make a, a purchase decision? And they and they all say, sorry, founders, but they all say, oh, I want the BDM bring that with them. And and they don't realize that the BDM's job is not to sell it, set up a sales function and and to set, set up the, the the infrastructure and to set up the process. The, what the rep wants, what the BDM wants, is to come into an organization where that's all set up for them, hmm. where they can just land on day one and start uh, start producing from day one. They, they don't want to spend two or three months working out a sales process and, and uh, working out and testing a value proposition and setting up a CRM system. You know, that, that's not their job, and they're not getting paid a commission while they're not selling and doing that instead. So 
as a consequence of all that, what happens inevitably is that the web stays a couple of months, maybe three, then then says, oh, bugger that, leaves and moves on to greener pastures and the founder has got to start from scratch again. Mm. So my, my advice to all the founders is get yourself a sales process, get yourself a sales funnel and get yourself a value proposition that is proven and already working, right? And then you can plug in more salespeople you can plug in more leads into the top and more sales will drop out the bottom. Mm, that's very interesting. And, I, and it makes me reflect on one of the strategies, you know, a, a long time ago, one of my marketing managers actually uh, told me, and he said, you know, my, he said, you know, Sean, we've got, we've got all these leads coming in and I know everybody wants more leads and we're willing to spend the money. He goes, but 90% of these people have had interest and don't convert. And we don't know what the problem is with the 90%. We're all very focused on the 10% and trying to get 10 to 11 or 10 to 12, or just increase the number of leads so more of those 10% drop into sales. But actually, shouldn't we go through an exercise of just getting rid of the no's? Like what are all the reasons for the no's? Can't we just systematically go through and get rid of each one of those no's with our value proposition, take away the reasons they're not buying? Okay, no, it's, not going to go to a, it's not going to go from 10 to 100, but it's probably going to go from 10 to something. Um, something better. And we're already paying for those leads. Oh, by the way, we've got, you know, 30 or 40,000 of those people in the database as well. Maybe we can go back to them. And that really changed my mind when it came to thinking about the value proposition. I really agree with you. I think that's a, if you don't have a value proposition that's already working and a sequence, which fundamentally as the founder, you've got to figure out and you may need some support to, you know, to kind of work through that process. If you've got no sales background whatsoever, you might need, you know, but you probably need do you need help from a marketing person or do you need help from a salesperson? What do you think, Peter? Um, okay, I think you need help from a salesperson first. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, that's why my book is called Smarketing because mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that sales and marketing should really be seamless and, and not be separate uh, in separate silos and separate yeah. functions. Right? But, but the, um, <clears throat> the, the interesting thing about lead gen is that <sighs> people go for volume. Oh, we need more leads. But if you think about it, you don't need more leads. You just need better leads. Hmm. Right? So, so it's, it's much better for you to have a smaller number of better qualified leads than, than a thousand lukewarm ones. And, and, and the other thing that I totally agree with you on is that qualifying an opportunity out is just as important as qualifying an opportunity in because it saves you so much time just like we talked about earlier with the, you know, is there a good match for us? Yes or no. So if you, if you make that um, the first port of call for your, for your sales funnel to say, look, is there even a good fit? You can save yourself a whole lot of heartache down the track because uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of CRMs that are full of um, junky um, sales funnel, sales um, pipeline. Yeah. Now I sort of jumped in on you there. So you're, so you're saying, okay, some of the mistakes they make, um, uh, some of the mistakes the founders make one they're sort of focused on the investor pitch not the customer pitch two they they're sort of step one i need some sales is to go and get a sales rep and then assume that the sales rep is actually going to build the function what else do we need do they need to be thinking about and so because i'm conscious also of the you know the mistakes but then we really want to make sure we go okay well what should they be doing instead so let's let's okay. continue on the stakes what else what so other be, other mistakes we'll be make? very clear on what problem your your app or your solution solves right talk about how it helps a customer to overcome a challenge, to to avoid a risk, or to take care of an, or to make use of an opportunity. Right? <clears throat> Don't talk about the product or the app or the service. Talk about what outcome it achieves for your ideal customer. And and mm. if you then have a story to tell, that says, "Oh, Mr. Customer, Mr. Prospect, <laughs> um, he, he's, uh, you remind me a little bit of this other company that we've helped, where." And then I then I say there's actually three, some say four steps in, in how to tell a story. And they are say what the customer looked like when you first met them. What were the challenges? What were their problems? What were the consequences of that problem of those problems? Mm -hmm. What were the consequences of those problems for the individual, for the uh, for the peer of the individual that you're talking to? So if we're talking to the CIO you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. we say, oh, that other CIO. He nearly got fired because all these other things happened, and he was coming home stressed through the eyeballs, and uh, brought his stress home home, and his wife wasn't very happy with him, and and, and you know he had a lot of a lot of uh, difficulty in his life. 
But then what happened was we did this, and then we talk about what solution we implemented, how long it mm -hmm. took, and, and what, uh, what was involved. And then the th step three is what changed for the customer. So the customer went from um, losing money, spending too much time, um, having um, problems with customers, to making money, to saving time, and to, um, to having happy customers. And by the way, the CIO's wife's now happy with him as well because he doesn't come home as stressed to, um, to mm. the eyeballs anymore, right? Mm. So, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it takes a business proposition and, and turns into something quite relatable and also a bit personal. Because mm. if we if we're relaying the the fate of this CIO that used to be stressed to the eyeballs and now is no longer, then our CIO, the one that we're talking to, might say, "Well, I want a bit of that too," and then they might go, "Well, how would that work for us?" And again, they give you their permission to to sell to them. So storytelling mm. is very important in business, and and uh, founders don't do enough of it because they they focused on how great is their product because it's their little baby, right? The one they've nurtured and, and brought to life. But unfortunately, your buyer is not interested in your product, app, or service. Mm. All they're interested in is what does it do for me? What's the outcome it achieves for me? What's the opportunity it creates? What's the risk it avoids? Or what's the, um, the problem it solves for me? That sounds so simple, but I guarantee, and there are plenty of founders who will be listening to this today who have no technology background whatsoever. They're running a services business. They don't know a sort of an apple from a um, from something else that's more <laughs> techni technical. Um, but listen to you, do some dummy calls and listen to your sales team, and take put Peter's lens back on when you listen to that phone call in terms of what's being asked in terms of the questions where they're heading and where the, where the conversation ends up. Because I guarantee that 75% of that conversation is going to be your team doing exactly what Peter just told them not to do, which is we have this, we have that, we have this, we have that, we have this, we have that. Would you like it? It's like, hang on a second. Our whole business and the reason you probably set your company up in the first place is because you saw that your product or service could be a vehicle to an outcome but when everybody gets focused in on selling the thing, they're all focused on the vehicle like everybody wants the vehicle. Well, let's be clear. Nobody wants the vehicle. Nobody wants to buy the thing. They don't want to go through the thing. They don't want to have to work with the thing. Everybody wants the, the outcome that's on the other side of the thing. And so if, you're, if you imagine your business always, I always think of it's like the person is A, the outcome is C, and B is how you're going to get them there. Don't spend time. The, the, the part that's B is actually the smallest part that matters to exactly the way that you just said it. What was going on at A? What was happening at C? What was the person trying to achieve? The B is the bit that they link the thing together, but actually no one really cares about B. I always think about this in education. How many courses have you ever done where you really wanted to know the knowledge of the course? P people spend, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars on degrees. Do they actually want to learn the stuff from the degree? No, they want to be on the other side of the degree, doing the thing, doing the job, getting the outcome. No one wants to actually do the study. Study is boring and it's hard and it impacts your life and so on. It's like, it's not about the study people. It's about the thing on the other side of the study and where they're at right now. And how do we, how do we bridge that gap? Yeah, it's, it's like the old analogy of um, don't, don't sell the customer a, a hammer when all they want is a picture on the wall. Talk yeah. about talk about the picture on the wall. Don't talk about the hammer. Agreed. What else? Um, what else are we missing here, Peter? What else do founders need to be thinking about? Well, they, they need to be thinking about their competitors because okay. because a lot of um, founders think they don't have a comp competitor because their product's so unique. And sorry, but it's not. And 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 even if there's no exact equivalent of the same product or service or app that you that you're selling there'll be something else that competes for the same dollar. There's an alternative always, yeah. Well, or, or even if there's not, but, but there's something else that your customer could spend that money on sure. and, and not buy yours. Mm -hmm. So so the <clears throat> the biofocused sales funnel talks about how to, how to avoid, how to um, um, combat your, your competition, how to evade them, how to basically make them irrelevant. In a nutshell, how do, how do founders do that? What's the practical thing they need to be so thinking I, about? So I advise my clients, I advise my clients to proactively bring up a subject that your competitors will most likely try to avoid. And that, that subject is the subject of risk. 
buyer risk. Okay. Most most salespeople would say, oh, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, there's no problem here. Look at you know, how successful we are. You'll be successful as well. As well. Just trust us. Mm. Right? Whereas if you say, oh, Mr. Customer, would you agree that there's a risk in every business decision that you make? Yeah. Okay. So then you understand that there's a risk in this in, in you making this business decision as well. Oh, yeah. And the, the buyer will probably think, where the hell is he going with that? But but, but you're leading them to, to a particular thought process. And and then, then you say, that being the case, would you like to know what risks you're exposed to as a buyer in making this particular purchasing decision, regardless of whether you buy from us or from anybody else? What, what have I done right there? Well, you really, um, you're, you're actually kind of taking the, the scorpion or the white elephant and you're sticking it right on the table and you're setting up a conversation to be able to articulate like you don't have to comment on how everybody else deals with risk because you're actually creating credibility and trust in the process because they're like, wow, they're not running away from what I was sitting there thinking about in the back of my mind. That's they're just it, putting I've, it right out on the table. Exactly, Sean. I've, I've positioned myself on the same side as the buyer. I'm saying, look, there's a big, ugly, dangerous world out there. Let me show you how to avoid it. Hmm. So so we've, we've moved from the opposing ends of the table and making it an adversarial relationship where I'm trying to shove something down your throat to helping you make an informed buying decision. Mm. And then, and then you say, "Well, look. Now that you've you've asked me to point out to you what the risks are, I'll I'll say to you, these are the risks, and blah blah blah, th- you know, three or four risks. And the most, the lowest common denom- denominator of risk is, it's the customer. You'll spend your money, and you won't get what you what you think you paid for. Yeah, right. That's that's the lowest common denominator. So so." Everything else you can you can you can say. Look, uh, the implementation can go wrong. The support could be bad. The um, the warranty might run out, or you know, what whatever the the, the the risks are for your particular product, service, or app. The next question is then you say to the customer, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, would you like to know how we at X Y Z Corporation help our customers to mitigate those risks? Yes, I'm. <laughs> yes, I will. Got a lean forward moment out of that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm so, like, yep, yep. Tell me. And, and so then you, you say, well, we mitigate these risks by having a warranty, by having um, credentials, by having done it before, by having a uh, a, a um, support and, and uh, um, maintenance process. You know, what, whatever mm. you do to make sure your customer is safe and that they're making yeah. a good decision and they're being well, they feel and are well supported. So what, what the customer will think then is, hang on, every other bastard has said, trust me, there's no risk. This guy is the only one that's mentioned risk to me and he's told me why they care about it and he's told me how they avoid it. I think I'm going to trust this guy more than anybody else. Mm, yeah. So you bring bring up proactively something that your competitors will probably avoid. Yeah. I always imagine that. I, I love that. And I, I always imagine it as everybody's sitting around a meeting table in a boardroom and there's a scorpion running around on the floor and no one's talking about it, but everyone knows that it's there. And it's like, can someone please pick up the scorpion, stick it in the middle of the table and say, did you know that there's a scorpion in the middle of the table? And everyone all of a sudden goes, oh my God, there's a scorpion. And I was like, yeah, but we can talk about it because now we've got a strategy. We can talk, we're, all, we're all seeing the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. It's not running around. We're not like running around scared in the back of our minds. Yeah, it really brings it into the light. There is one more that I can relate to you. Please, yes. And it's sure. actually a, it's actually a real life working example. So so I talked about that once we fend off our competitors, we need to still make sure that we win the deal. And there is a technique that I teach my clients on how they can get themselves a second or maybe even third bite at the same cherry that their competitors will probably not be. Be, uh, that will not be available to your competitors. And, and that is, this, this only works if it's not a tender situation. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so what happens is the, the customer will usually say to, to, to the rep, send me a proposal. Right. What's the worst thing you can do when somebody asks you to send them a proposal? 
just send them a proposal and say, great, when you've had a look at it, let me know what you think. Exactly. So when the customer says, send me a proposal, the worst thing you can do is send a proposal. Big time. <laughs> so, so what I teach my clients to do is to say, that's great, Sean. I'd love to send you a proposal. It is very important to us at XYZ Corporation that our proposals meet ex your exact expectations. Therefore, can we get together on Thursday at 2 p.m. to walk through the proposal just to make sure it, it uh, fits your requirements? So, so there's two, two ways this can go, right? One is the client will say, yep, that's great. Glad you care. Let's get together on Thursday at 2 p.m. What does that show you? They're engaged. They're serious about the, mm. the, about you know, giving that business to you part, perhaps, yeah. right? What happens if they say, no, 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 sure, that's fine. Just send it through the way it is. Already decided. So you think, okay, that we're probably the third quote that they need to get for, for probity reasons. Mm -hmm. They may have already decided who they're going with. We've got pretty much zero chance of winning this deal. If, if that happens to you, then you've got to make a decision. You can, you can say, okay, look, we're just going to throw our hat in the ring and, and, and send the proposal out and cross our fingers. Or we can, we can cut our losses and say, I'm very sorry, Mr. Customer, that's not how we play. It's very important to us that our proposals hit the, uh, hit the mark, so therefore we won't be bidding. Very, that's very courageous. You've got to be very courageous to do that. Right? Mm. Um, but there, but there is a third uh, compromise that you can solution that you can use as well. Which and, is, and this is, <laughs> and this is where you send the proposal, but you don't date it. You do not sign it. You take out all pricing, and you write a big fat watermark letters draft all over it and send it off. What will happen? You get a phone call if they're interested going, what is all this draft all over my thing and where's the pricing? Where's the pricing, right? So, so, so then you, you, you can say again, Mr. Customer, there's no point putting pricing to something that we're not sure will suit you. So therefore, we've just sent you, um, for, you know, as a courtesy to you, the, uh, the draft yeah. so that you can have a look at it and say whether we, it's worth us putting pricing against it or not. Right? Now, the customer might by that stage get totally cheesed off and never do business with you again. Or they might say, look, these guys are actually serious about doing the right thing for me, so I better let them. Right? Mm. Um, on the other hand, if, if, if they say, yep, I'll get together with you at 2 p.m. on Thursday, then they will actually help you to write their proposal for them. Yeah, big time. Right? Because they might say, oh, that's not what we meant. Mm. Or, no, no, we don't need that. And, oh, no, we, but we need a bit more here. Right? Yeah. So, so, so I wanted, I'm, I'm and or they are teaching you, I think sometimes depending on who the person is also how to sell, they may have some other sign off. Okay. They're the CIO, but I don't know the CEO has to tick it off or something. And they're, they're going to be in that meeting thinking, what's the CEO going to do when he sees that written? Okay. We need to write it this way because exactly. I want to get this thing over the line. So they help you write your proposal for you. Mm. Now I, I want to give you a real life story about that. So, so I, I've got a customer in, in the States on the um, west coast of uh, California, west coast USA. They're in a uh, technology advisory business. And a customer rang them up and said, look, can you send us a proposal? <laughs> and and, and this, this, this uh, CEO, the president, he, he said to the customer, yep, that's fantastic. We really pride ourselves in, in, in getting our proposals right. So can we get together you know, to this? This was a multi-million dollar project. And the proposal was for, for that multi-million dollar project. When my customers said to their customer, can we get together to make sure it, it suits you? They agreed and they sent their entire executive team into this meeting. It lasted for two and a half hours. Do you, do you think after all that effort, they would have gone to somewhere else and done the same thing with somebody else? Well, no one else would have even asked them the question. So My customer won a multi-million dollar deal just by asking that question saying, can we get together on Thursday at 2 p.m.? Mm. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And that's, yeah, 
to your earlier point, it's equally applicable to smaller companies. It doesn't have to be a million, multi-million dollar no, deal. No. This can work. Uh, this can work anywhere. First day two PM is, is magic. <laughs> yeah, first day two PM. I like it. Um, Peter, conscious of how much time we've got left, one of the things I'd love to talk to you about and get your perspective on is how founders might think about building up that sales function. So let's just say, you know, you've got a founder who's, okay, they've figured out their sales process. They've been working on their value proposition. They've got, you know, they, they can see it's working really nicely. Now they've gone and maybe they've, they've got a couple of, um, you know, people on and they're managing them directly, but they don't want to manage the sales team. And okay, maybe they've got two or three people. That's about as much sales people management as they can possibly handle. And now they're really trying to figure out how do I scale this thing without me having to manage everyone? But, you know, am I, is it too early to be hiring a manager? Do I take one of these reps and have them sort of step up as a sort of player coach type model? Like how, do, how should founders be thinking about how they build up the sales function once it's sort of started and it's working? Yeah, it, it's it's a tricky one, not just for founders, it's, but for, for leaders of all size companies, right? Mm. <clears throat> and, and the temptation is to promote your best performing sales reps into a, into a sales leadership role, right? But but you think you think about it. Many sales reps get promoted to the point of incompetence when that happens, right? And, and it's nothing wrong with the sales reps. It's it's just they were a star individual contributor, a star performer by themselves in a sales role. Suddenly you're taking them out of that that environment, and you're sticking them into a position where they have people under them, and they got to be a people manager when they've never led people before. And managing people is quite different to managing sales, right? And 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 so what what then happens is that the the rep that's been promoted will then say, well, everybody just do what I used to do when I was a rep, and then you'll be successful as well. But but they can't be that guy, right, or that person. Um, so so I don't promote anybody to the point of incompetence. Mm-hmm. Make sure that they're supported. Don't don't stick them into a sales training course. Pat them on the back and say, good luck to you now. Because any sort of training, doesn't matter whether it's product training or sales training or any sort of skills training, will go in one ear and come out the other if it's not supported with ongoing on-the-job coaching to bed in the learnings and to actually apply them to real-life situations. So So I say that a sales leader must be a leader and not, not just a manager. They must mm. actually support and help their reps to be the best version of themselves that they can be, not bash them up every Monday morning in a cadence call. Right? Yeah, so, you see that a lot with salespeople that get <laughs> uh, put into management roles because they don't. that's almost how they flagellate themselves every Monday morning. They might, this just might be their model of the world. They just beat themselves up because they didn't make enough calls last week. Well, so they, they don't even have to beat else. themselves up. They get beaten up from, from the boss yeah. every week as well and every month, you know, and particularly when it comes to those crunch times, end of month, end of quarter, end of year. Hmm. And, and and there's another funny thing that happens, by the way, that, that is that at the beginning of the quarter, the sales leader might say, Sean, take your time, get to know your customer, understand what their, what their problems and opportunities are and you know, get to know them a bit better. Three weeks later, at the end of the, the quarter, they go, where's that sale? Close the deal. <laughs> <laughs> so you go from one extreme to the other and the rep totally gets confused and, and, and mm. you know, from, from wanting to be nurturing to wanting to pressure the customer to buy. So there's, there's another dichotomy that, that disturbs me about conventional sales processes. But, <clears throat> but the, the problem is quite easily solved. The, 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 the problem that you describe, namely how do we scale, is quite easily solved if you have a structured, proven and scalable sales process set up and, and, and that's what the buyer focused sales funnel does it sets up a sales framework that is scalable and like i said you can plug in more reps and more sales will come out you can plug in more leads and more sales will come out and you never really need to change it dramatically you might just tweak it if you have a new product or you go into a new market or you expand you know internationally or what, whatever you're doing right but um but if if you have your sales process set up well right from the start you you will not have a problem with unwinding things that, that you just sort of threw together in the beginning you know if if you have one sales rep bringing one sales rep bringing their process and then you have another sales rep bringing another process by the time you have four or five reps 
you end up with a spaghetti warrant of different processes and different experiences that your customers have depending on who, the, who they're talking to and it will never be consistent. Mm. So, so my advice to anybody is get your house in order, get yourself a nice structured, scalable and proven sales process that you can then use to grow the business with. It's, it's simple if you get it right at the beginning. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And I think sometimes, you know, sometimes a founder who's growing out a sales team will start with, and I guess it, it sort of, it depends on the level of sophistication of the founder in sales and sales management and have they, have they done it before? Do they sort of know what they're doing or do they need more help? Sometimes a better model if you're just building out your sales team is actually to get a more senior person. I don't mean like super senior, but let's just say as your first salesperson, get somebody who's actually capable, who's got the leadership chops, who's, you know, that they've managed a team before. They're going to be capable of growing the team under them and have them work with you to help build out that sales, um, that funnel and really optimize it, but they're going to be doing the sales themselves for a shorter period of time because they'll get it right faster and then they can build people underneath them. That can quite often give a founder more support, but yes, it means you have to invest a little bit ahead of the curve, but it's sometimes a faster way to build out um, the sales function rather than getting a whole bunch of reps until you're, you know, you're, you're drowning in your sales management workload and then hoping that you'll get a leader who's then going to be able to get the most out of them and, you know, not all of them gel together. It's just one way people can think about it too. Well, that takes a lot of foresight on the behalf of the founder though, right? Because mm. you must be willing to invest. True. You know, uh, I, but I, there are definitely I, founders out there that, I, you know, that I've worked with that, that have thought about it that way um, and for that exact reason. So that person also gets the joy of getting to build a new team. You know, they might have been, they might be comfortable, you know, leading a team or, or multiple teams, but actually are on the journey with you and your business, love where it's going, want to be the one to build out the sales function. So you you invest a bit further head up, but they've got to be willing to get in and do the sales them first, themselves first, right? And that'll talk quite a lot of the characteristic of the individual. You know, are they willing to be on the front line with their team? Are they happy to do the sales and then, you know, and then grow the team uh, after them, assuming that they're not going to stay stuck in the sales role? I, I, I had this conversation with a, with a founder just not long ago. And I said, okay, how much do you think such a leader is going to cost you? Right? And, and they said, well, you tell me. And I said, it's going to be north of 150K, maybe 200K. Right? How long will that take to set up everything in the sales process and the value proposition stuff? And they said, well, maybe six months. So I said, so you're going to spend $100,000 on, on getting a sales process set up first. And they went, ah. <laughs> so, so. You got to be if if that's the way you want to go. You got to be prepared to have that investment and, and take the time to get that right at the beginning. Yeah. Right? yeah. I I don't know how many founders have that patience and have that mm. um, that that gumption to, to go down that path. I agree. So, yeah, I can't imagine you'd be starting cold uh, so, to be able to bring on yeah. that kind of model. So, so that's why I'm saying just just get get a sales process set up by somebody who knows what they're talking well, about. Works. Mm -hmm. And 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 then plug in your sales reps, right? And you can yeah. still hire somebody that's that's uh, mature enough to take over the leadership role down the track. But that you don't need to get them to spend six months setting everything up and, and paying them, you know, good dollars for that. Yeah, and every you know some people yeah will really some people will want to reach out for help because again it depends on the nature of the founder. But there's no reason that with a bit of investment in your own learning and thinking you know reading reading books like Peter's talking to people thinking about you know listening to your competitors' calls taking these principles on and going okay I can actually optimize my own sales process and once I know that it's working then seek to replicate it. But don't look to you know if you think about the one set of metrics that you really can't afford to just hope somebody else is going to pick up it's sales because you run out of revenue. There's not everything else is academic. You know, uh, that doesn't mean anything else is less important, but if you're not taking care of the sales, the other stuff becomes academic and, um, yeah, and you're not going to be able to manage the costs. Okay. Peter, I'm conscious of how much time we've got left. Um, and we're, we're starting to run a little short. I, I would love to get your thoughts. I know we had a little bit of a chat offline about this around metrics. Uh, you know, fundamentally as you're, you know, when you're growing out a sales function, uh, some people get absolutely bamboozled by the significant number of things that you can measure and can end up trying to really measure and focus on everything. Uh, and some people probably focus on, uh, probably measure far too little and actually don't really have a good sense or a pulse of what's going on in their, in their sales function, which again, you know, is fundamentally driving the revenue engine of the business. How do you think about what sort of lead or lag indicators are important for a founder to focus on um, if there was only if there was only a few, how would you guide someone to think about how they set up their their sort of sales and marketing reporting? 
Yeah, so so I, I still would have some of the, the traditional metrics, right? So so uh, revenue, pipeline, maybe, maybe even coverage. So coverage is if, if we need to make $100,000 and we win every third deal, we should actually have $300,000 worth of deals in the pipeline so we can be sure we get the $100,000. That, that's coverage, right? Mm-hmm. But all that's just measuring what we want to achieve. I, I really think that modern selling needs to include a customer metric as well. And and I'd, I'd dearly like to use something like an engagement quality metric. So, so we say, how happy is the customer with their buying experience? And and by the way, I'm not just talking about NPS because uh, not net promoter score because uh, you know we're all we're all tired of giving a rating out of ten and would you recommend us to your mates? Um, so yeah. so the um, that that's kind of not really that useful anymore. Um, but but if we if we can just get informal feedback or we we ask a, an open question like, what could we do better? What should we do more of? What would what should we stop doing? Mm. Then, then we we can gauge the the true response from the customer. The customer can talk about what they want to talk about, not what we want to measure. Mm. So, so have all the traditional metrics, but but have a customer metric in there as well, because you you get gold back from the customer if you only ask the right question. And and an open ended question is better than a closed question. So if you say if you don't say do you like us yes or no, you get a yes or no answer, but you still don't know why. Yeah. Whereas if you say what should we do more of? Then they go, oh, well, your competition does this and you don't do it and I really like what they do, so why don't you do the same thing? And, and you go, oh, my God, you never even knew <laughs> that they do that. Right? So you, you get intel from the customer directly as well. So it, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I, you know, actually, one of the things I think that's quite often missing is, you know, we talked about that uh, gap of, you know, if, if you've got a typical, I don't know, 10% conversion rate and therefore 90% aren't buying, my first question is, well, yeah, where is the analysis on the ninety percent? Now, that might be a series of metrics. That might be a, you know, that might be a post call survey on the IVR on the on the telephone system. It might be a post call survey via email. It could be a post call survey via text message. But it should be also be followed up with qualitative surveys. Someone needs to be asking these customers real questions about what their experience was in the process. And I don't think there's anything much more valuable, given you've already spent money on engaging with that person in a way, or they've spent money, they've spent effort on they've had enough interest to give you an email address or to come to a website or something something's not lining up either it's too early you don't have this you don't have that they don't need this like you know there's something happening where you've already spent that money but to the extent that we don't focus on what we're missing and what we're not thinking about and what their experience was all the way through that process we're missing major um, important information that without spending any more money to your early point on leads we can actually get better quality leads because we're figuring out the things that we're missing. And otherwise we're just sort of guessing, you know, where we're just focused on the ones that say yes, not the ones that, that don't say yes or yet. There, there is one really uh, other important thing <clears throat> about that. And that any, any time you ask your customer for, for any time. So I think your boom might just move no. down a little bit. And, sorry. Any time you ask your customer um, for feedback, you, you must not just go, oh, thanks, John, and never be heard from again. It's important that you go back to the customer and say, thank you for giving us that feedback. Here's what we're doing about it. Or even if you're not doing anything about it, That's here's why right. we're not doing anything about it. Right? Because by the time mm-hmm. you ask the customer two or three times about their feedback and then they hear nothing back from you, they're going to go, why am I still doing this? Right? There's nothing in it for me. Whereas if, yeah. if you make them feel like their feedback has actually contributed to a change in the organization to improve the service uh, experience or, or whatever, they, they'll go, okay, these guys are listening to me. And, and, and don't forget, we want that same customer to come back and buy more from us and we want them to advocate new business to us. So we better give them a good experience and we better help them to help us, giving them that better experience. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, I remember one of the most positive experiences I ever had with a major supplier who we used to spend a lot of money with, which was actually Adobe. Uh, and they used to invite us to their, you know, to a quarterly meeting where they would present to us what they thought their product roadmap was going to be based on what their customers were telling them. And they would use us as a sounding board and they'd mm. say, what do you think of this? What are we missing? What aren't we doing? What aren't we thinking about? And I just thought, and you would then see the next quarter, it's the first time you're going, 
well, let's see if they care about what we say. And the next quarter, you'd figure out, to your point, did they actually replay that back to you? This is what we heard last time. This is what we've done about it. This is how it's turning out. And you're going, wow, they actually listen. I'm going to come to this every time and I'm going to give them more feedback because I'm now part of this this process. That's and good. it makes you feel special a bit. Um, Peter, it does make you feel special. It does indeed. And I just think it's a, it's a you know, your customers have the answers. They're the ones who had the engagement with you. They know what it is that they want. We're just not usually very good at asking those questions and then finding a way to uh, to interpret it. Peter, uh, yeah, indeed, indeed. I could talk to you all day, uh, uh, all day long, and uh, but unfortunately, I don't get to do that today. So. Um, I just would really like to acknowledge uh, you for the way that you're approaching teaching people about sales, because um, I think there's far, it's far too easy when people are looking for answers around sales. I know of a business recently that um, bought, uh, I think it was, they bought the Wolf of Wall Street book and they basically had all their sales reps sort of read it. And they're like, this is how I want you to sell. And everyone was going, what? what are you talking about? Like so, so against the ethics and the culture of that business. But it, like my point is it's very easy for people to come at sales from the wrong philosophy uh, and actually not from a point of integrity, which is really to your point about how do I serve this customer? Is this a customer I can serve? How do I serve them and how do I serve them better so they can make a good decision for themselves, whether that's me or it's somebody else doesn't, you know, yes, I'd like it to be me more often, but actually I've got to figure out, you know, do I have a good value proposition and then can I create a space where they get to um, give me the information I need? I can give them some information to chew on that makes sense and then they get to choose at the end. Uh, so I really appreciate the way that you are bringing that um, to the market to all of your clients. So thank you very much for sharing some of your knowledge um, with all of our community today. Uh, you, I'm aware that you also have a, um, a diagnostic tool that people can um, tap into. Do you just want to share with our community what that is? G'day everybody, Sean Steele here, your host, just filling in for the little glitch that we had on Peter's side. What Peter wanted you to know is that he's actually made available to you a free assessment um, that helps you understand how buyer-focused your sales funnel is, which is one of the things we've been talking about in today's episode. The web address for that is peterstrakorb.com, which is Peter, the way it sounds, S-T-R-O-H-K-O-R-B.com forward slash sales hyphen assessment sales hyphen assessment, or you can just go to free resources through the link on his website and you will find it there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, for people to get in touch with you, obviously they can use that uh, web address to be able to follow along. I assume you're also on LinkedIn if people want to reach out and connect. Uh, if you've got any questions, folks, you can, of course, uh, also go to the scaleitspodcast.com uh, website. We've got a speak pipe button on the right-hand side. You can leave us an audio message, which, which we can get through to Peter. Or if you have you know, questions, of course, at any time about scaling your business that you'd like myself or myself with a guest uh, to handle in the future, please uh, feel free to send those through. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the show today. Huge thanks to to Peter Strakorb. Uh, and a couple of things before you go, if you got value from the things that Peter uh, had to say today, and I guarantee if you take a step back and look at your sales process and listen to what your salespeople are saying, or take a step back, even record one of your own conversations appropriately and listen back to it and, and ask yourself, are you actually focused on the outcome or are you focused on the thing? That alone can absolutely change the game in the quality of the conversations that you're having with potential prospects. And if you think about where the time is going into your business, uh, that's usually a big amount of time and a big amount of money. Uh, so if you got value from what you uh, heard today, please jump on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. We all get a huge kick out of that. helps other people find it. You can find us on uh, scallotspodcast.com. You can leave your email there. We can let you know when new episodes uh, or downloads uh, and tools are coming out. Or you can find us on the socials at Scalots Podcast uh, on pretty much your favorite social. But remember that the only thing that can actually prevent you from scaling up in full is giving up. So it's going to get tough. You're going to find you're going to have sales results that you don't like every now and again. You'd have salespeople that you don't think are doing a great job. But you know what? It's going to get tough and you have to stay on board and you have to stay unshakable in your faith and your conviction that you're going to get there and you have to stay flexible in your approach. Thank you very much for joining us today. You've been listening to the Scalots Podcast. I'm Sean Steele and we look forward to speaking to you again next week. Thanks so much, Peter. G'day everyone, just a couple of quick things before you go. If you have questions that you'd love myself or an upcoming guest to tackle about challenges that you're facing in scaling your business, please just jump straight on the website, scaleupspodcast.com. You can record your message straight from your mobile by hitting the button on the right-hand side of the page. 
or you can just email them the old-fashioned way, questions at scaleupspodcast.com. And just a quick reminder, nothing we spoke about today constitutes financial or business advice. If you are considering making big decisions in your business, seek out a professional who can look at your situation in detail and make sure you're getting sound, personalized advice. Thanks for listening. Look forward to being back in your podcast feed next week.